Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you so much to the organizers of the Cambridge conference, as, as well as to my fellow speakers, uh, whom I really enjoyed listening to. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to present my research on states' due diligence obligations in the practice of international courts and tribunals. Now, it is a common knowledge that there is, in fact, no uniform interpretation of due diligence, which, as we have heard from uh, the keynote speaker today, and uh, several of my fellow speakers have alluded to, is essentially context, harm, and actor specific, which is very much in line with the ILA study group findings on the subject. Now, I would like to submit to you that despite the infinite variety of the terms of the obligations of conduct that require states to exercise their due diligence, in other words, best efforts to avert a particular result, International courts and tribunals do seem to employ similar yardsticks when analyzing when, how, and what states are required to do to comply with their due diligence obligation in order to achieve that particular result. So basically, a very simple analytical decomposure of the existing practice of international courts and tribunals into the trigger of due diligence obligation. In other words, when does it kick in? the scope of its application, in other words, how does it apply both spatial, spatially and temporally, and finally, the material content of due diligence. In other words, what does the state have to do in order to actually discharge its obligation? Turning to the trigger of due diligence, the so-called when, here I think we can analytically decompose into two aspects which we currently come up in the analysis of international courts and tribunals. First, there is the risk of harm, and second, the knowledge of the risk. In relation to the risk of harm, we could think about three, uh, really sort of uh, three benchmarks. First, does the risk need to be qualified? And the answer given by most international courts and tribunals, yes, there must be a real and imminent risk as opposed to hypothetical risk that could occur. Uh, the court, for example, in the genocide case, spoke of the serious risk of genocide. Um, more generally, that is related also to whether there has to be some level of qualification of the harm itself. Uh, and again, here across the board, we see references to significant harm. In other words, something which is more than detectable, but need not be at the level of serious or substantial as a harm. The second aspect is, does the harm need to be certain? And the overarching answer of international courts and tribunals is that while the harm needs to be foreseeable on the basis of the best information available to the state, whether it is technical or scientific, it may also in certain circumstances entail the adoption of a precautionary approach, for example, in cases of scientific uncertainty, as it was highlighted in the CBED advisory opinion or the Inter-American Court in its advisory opinion to which my colleagues have just referred. The final aspect in relation to this analysis, the risk of harm, is do the origins of the harm matter? And again, the answer here is overarchingly no, in the sense that it doesn't depend whether the origins of the risk lie with another state, non-state actors conduct or natural hazard. The second aspect, as I mentioned, as going to the trigger of due diligence obligation is the knowledge of the risk. And here, essentially, the big question hanging out there is um, what is the standard of knowledge that is required of the state? Uh, courts seem to align in the perception that it's either actual or constructive knowledge which are sufficient to satisfy the threshold, regardless really of the area of law or the nature of the harm compare cases such as Bosnia genocide of the ICJ or Osman v. UK uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. However, importantly, there is no automatic presumption that control as such over the territory means that the state should have known of the harm. And we have seen that in cases such as Corfu or Nicaragua. But as the court noted in Corfu Channel, the mere fact that the state exercises exclusive control over its territory does not in fact result in prima facie responsibility, nor shifts the burden of proof. But at the same time, importantly, the state, that territorial state may up to a certain point be bound to supply 
particulars of the use made by it of the means of information and inquiry at its disposal. Similarly, courts and tribunal appear to be much more willing to take into account circumstantial evidence when analyzing questions relating to knowledge in such cases. The second uh, aspect to which we can turn in the analysis of uh, the practice of courts and tribunals is what is the scope of application of due diligence obligation. And here there are again two subsets of considerations. First, the spatial consideration. Uh, as we all know, uh, physical control of a territory, and I'm quoting here, is the basis of state responsibility for acts affecting other states. And I'm quoting from the Namibia advisory opinion. Now, that control, however, need not be construed necessarily as an effective control in the way that we have conceptualized it for the purposes of attribution of conduct. Nor, it seems, according to quite a few uh, courts and tribunals, that a temporary absence of an effective control over a particular portion of territory necessarily relieve a state from its due diligence obligation as we have seen, for example, in the Alaska decision of the European Court of Human Rights or the Bosnia genocide case. In fact, the court in the latter uh, found that it was necessary to examine a state's capacity to prevent genocide in terms of, and I quote, the geographical distance of the state concerned from the scene of the event and on the strength of political links as well as other links between the authorities of that state and the main actors in the events. In fact, a, a, a trend seems to be occurring in the in the practice of international courts and tribunals towards focusing much more on the on the control over the activities that may cause a particular harm rather than necessarily only over the person or the territory where that harm may be occurring as to the second aspect the temporal aspect of the scope of application of due diligence uh, the court seemed to emphasize that we are talking about essentially an ex ante evaluation of the risk, but that the obligation of due diligence applies throughout the entire period of the activities that pose the risk of harm. Um, again, pulp mills or Kishanganga ward may be referred to, and that implies the monitoring obligations of the effects of the activity posing the risk of harm. Turning to my third and final um, sort of analytical uh, constellation, uh, which goes to the material content of due diligence, the what, here essentially uh, the existing output can be um, decomposed into two main aspects. One is the means that are reasonably available. And of course, while we don't have a single formula, there are several indicia to uh, verify uh, whether the obligation of due diligence has been discharged. Uh, these are uh, the monitoring and the supervision, the risk assessment uh, in various contexts, notification and consultation in good faith with other potentially affected states, the enaction of legislation and administrative policy and regulations. Importantly, however, it is not sufficient to adopt regulatory or administrative measures but also, as the court has emphasized in the pulp mills case, as well as ITLUS in the fisheries advisory opinion or the Philippines China Tribunal, a certain level of vigilance in their enforcement and the exercise of administrative control. Moreover, the means that can effectively be employed to discharge such due diligence obligations need to be updated and may in fact change with the passage of time as was underscored in the CBAT advisory opinion, paragraph 117. The second important component going to that material content of due diligence is the gravity of the risk. The principle is that the graver the risk of harm, the greater, greater the means the state has to employ in order to discharge its obligation. Uh, and, and here courts have further uh, helped us in our understanding of that uh, relationship by indicating that the question of whether the underlying activities are a one-off conduct or a recurrent systematic activity is immaterial, in fact, to assessing whether the breach of an obligation of due diligence has occurred. Finally, what we gather from the practice of international courts and tribunals, that it is no defense for a state to argue that even if it had taken all measures reasonably available to it, the harm would still have occurred. 
as the court uh, emphasized in its Bosnia genocide case, it is irrelevant whether the state claims or even proves that even if it had employed all means reasonably at its disposal, they would not have sufficed to prevent the commission of genocide. In conclusion, I would submit to you that the output of, output of courts and tribunals in respect of when, how, and, in, and what in respect of due diligence seems to point in the direction of many more common features of analysis uh, underlying whether the diligence has been actually fulfilled than the inherent differences there from one area of public international law to another. Thank you.